Okay, so in previous weeks we've been doing various things with the eye. We stayed outside the eyeball. This week we're going to get inside the eyeball and we're sticking with nerves. This time we've got to work out how sympathetic nerves get into the eyeball, how parasympathetic nerves get into the eyeball and how the intraocular muscles are innervated. Um, so there's still quite a lot to do. I think what we'll do is we'll start anteriorly. So we'll start with the bit we can see. We'll start with the pupil and the iris because you know the pupil gets larger and smaller. And then we'll go a step back and we'll look at the lens and the muscles that affect the lens. And then we'll do the last bit of the retina, which I'm not going to do in any detail at all. I'm just going to say retina, optic nerve, that's about it. Um, and then we should have... Oh, there's also a bit of general sensation as well. Remember the trigeminal nerve? That sends a branch inside the eyeball to get to the cornea. If we layer it up like that, the complexity that you see on some diagrams should seem less confusing. All right, good luck. Okay, so I've got, oh, I've got a lot of models today. Let's have a look inside this eyeball, right? This one, this is just the eyeball without the muscles and stuff. You can see, you get an idea of the back there. Look at all the little nerves that are going in there. Um, now if I take this apart, um, so the see-through bit is the cornea. And then, of course, we've got the iris here and the pupil in the middle. And you know the pupil changes size in response to the amount of light available. So if it's very bright, the, the pupil gets smaller. And if it's not very bright, the pupil slowly dilates, right? If you flash a light, if you shine a light into somebody's eyes, you should see that. In fact, if you shine a light into one eye, you should see the same reaction in both pupils. So what we must have here, so in the iris then, there are two muscles. We have one circular muscle, which is sphincter pupillae. And then we have um, a muscle, like a radial muscle, with the fibres running in this direction around the outside, kind of in the, in the direction of lines that you see the iris in. And that's dilator pupillae. Um, one is innervated by sympathetic nerve fibres and one is innervated by parasympathetic nerve fibres. Um, so both of those are motor autonomic nerves. So obviously the, you don't have control over pupillary dilation and constriction. It's an autonomic response. Now, which one does which? The way to remember is rabbit in the headlights, right? So, um, um, you know, uh, the sympathetic nervous system and adrenaline are responsible for the fight or flight response. Part of that fight or flight response, if you think about the rabbit in the headlights, it stops still, wide eyes, dilated pupils as well, maybe. Um, so dilator pupillae, the muscle with the radial fibres like that, that's innervated by the sympathetic uh, nerves and that causes the pupil to, to widen. Also, do you remember we talked about the, the muscle up here, the, uh, the, the superior tarsal muscle, which also has sympathetic fibres, which just causes the lifting of the eyelids and blah, 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 blah. See? Um, so that means that the opposite then, the parasympathetic nerves innervate sphincter pupillae, which then running radially around here cause the sphincter to close and your pupils to shrink in response to bright daylight. Those are all smooth muscles within the iris on the other side of the coloured part, um, which kind of aren't really shown on here. The, the next bit then, can you see? There's the lens. So the pupil is a hole and the lens is on the other side. This is the anterior chamber under here. So what about the lens then? You're probably aware that the lens changes shape. The job of the lens is to focus light on the retina at the back of the eye, right? And we're not going to go into the physics of all of that, but there is a lot of physics there. Um, when we look at something far away, when we focus on a distant object, the lens is quite thin and it focuses that distant light onto the retina so that we see a sharp image. Um, whereas when we're reading, when we're looking at something close up, when we're focusing on a close object, the lens fattens and by fattening, it again uh, focuses the light from that near object on the retina to give us a sharp image. Now that's what us mammals do, is we change the shape of the lens. I think birds of prey have got, I think they could even change the shape of their cornea, and they might even have two fovea on the, on the retina. They, you know, it, 
which accounts for their amazing eyesight. But us mammals, we, we do that by changing the shape of the lens. If we change the shape of the lens, how are we going to do that? It's going to be muscular. And again, it's autonomic because we're not, I mean, you can kind of, you, you can kind of control the focus a bit, can't you? But um, essentially it's under autonomic control. Uh, the way in which this works is a little bit backwards. Inside the eye, there are three layers of tissues. One of those layers is called the vascular layer. And the vascular layer, where it exists around the lens, because obviously it's going to leave a hole for the lens, there is um, a, a smooth muscle arranged within that vascular layer. The muscle in this vascular layer is called the ciliary body. So the ciliary body when you see it in an illustration, of course, you're only ever seeing it in 2D, like a cross-sectional thing, so it's like, it looks like a flat thing. But always imagine the ciliary body as a sphincter, as a circular sphincter, like other sphincters in the body. And it runs around the lens. Now, the lens is suspended from the ciliary body by um, fibres, by like ligamentous fibres, by collagen fibres. These fibres get called zonular fibres or zonular fibres. Um, uh, this area gets called the zonule of Zin, which is a great name. Um, uh, so these fibres of Zin, if you want to... Uh, the contemporary term would be to call this a suspensory ligament. There are other suspensory ligaments around the body. There's another one outside the eye. You've come across lots of suspensory ligaments at all. It's a good general term. But um, the lens is suspended from the ciliary body by fibres running around it in between them. Um, and that would be the suspensory ligament. So again, it's a circular suspensory ligament. So, now what happens? Right, when the ciliary body contracts, it's going to shrink because it's a sphincter, right? And when the ciliary body relaxes, it's going to open up because it's a sphincter. And that's what sphincters do. What effect is that going to have on the lens? Well, if the lens is in the middle and it's, it's suspended from the ciliary body by those collagen fibres, by that suspensory ligament, when the ciliary body relaxes and gets bigger, the lens is going to get stretched and flattened. So when the ciliary body is relaxed, you're going to be able to focus on distant objects. When the ciliary body contracts, then um, those, that suspensory ligament is also going to relax and the lens is going to shrink and it's going to fatten, which means that when the ciliary body contracts, you're able to focus on near objects. This is essentially controlled by parasympathetic innervation. So these, that's the muscles in the ciliary body are controlled by parasympathetic nerves. So when there is parasympathetic innervation, um, it contracts and you focus on near objects. And when that parasympathetic innervation is removed, the ciliary body relaxes, the, uh, the, the lens gets stretched and you focus on distant objects. Hopefully the way I've explained it seems really straightforward because the first time you encounter it, it, may, it often seems a bit backwards. If I describe to you why it's confusing, you're going to get confused. If you've not been confused by it, then you're not confused now, so that's good, right? Next question. Where do those parasympathetic nerve fibres come from? Um, well, we looked at the extraocular muscles. And we saw that most of the extraocular muscles moving the orbit were innervated by the oculomotor nerve, very well named, cranial nerve 3, and also the trochlear and abducens nerve. Well, it turns out that the intraocular muscles are also innervated by the oculomotor nerve. Good, huh? Um, so the oculomotor nerve produces mostly somatic motor neurons for those extraocular muscles, but also parasympathetic neurons. So it, it produces a bunch of preganglionic parasympathetic neurons, um, which go out and they, their destination are the, are the uh, smooth muscle fibre, uh, smooth muscle fibres of the of the ciliary body and the um, sphincter pupillae muscles. Right. Um, 
Do you remember where the ocular motor nerve comes from? It's a bit bigger on this model than it was on the other model, but the ocular motor nerve comes out of the midbrain here. Um, and for some reason, the parasympathetic nucleus involved in this is, is quite famous and people seem to remember his name, the Edinger Westphal nucleus. And do you remember last time we were talking about the cerebral aqueduct here? and the midbrain here. Well, the Edinger Westphal nucleus is very close to the other nuclei of the ocular motor nerve. Um, it's in the midbrain and it pops out, as we saw there. Dives through the superior orbital fissure. At the back of the orbit, because that's how pretty much everything gets from the cranial cavity into the orbit, unless you're the optic nerve or similarly special. Um, and then those preganglionic parasympathetic nerves get to the ciliary ganglion. And the ciliary ganglion is one of the four parasympathetic ganglia of the head. I say four, there's four on each side. Um, so parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves, we have preganglionic neurons coming out of the central nervous system. They find their way to a ganglion, a collection of cell bodies. They synapse with another neuron and that postganglionic neuron goes off to its target organ. Now in the case of the, um, the, the, the parasympathetic nerves going to the, the eye, going inside the eye, oh, God. Um, um, uh, pop that off, pop that off, that there, that, that's the ciliary ganglion. And in the ciliary ganglion, then that's a parasympathetic ganglion, those preganglionic parasympathetic neurons, parts of the ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve 3, they run in there, they meet a postganglionic parasympathetic neuron, synapse with it, and that neuron shoots off uh, and through these nerves here to get into the orbit. These nerves get called the short ciliary nerves because stuff around here gets called ciliary. But if there are short ciliary nerves, then there must be long ciliary nerves. And these other nerves going up here, these longer ones, those are the long ciliary nerves. Um, so those postganglionic parasympathetic neurons run within the short ciliary nerves to get into the eyeball, and then they whip off to those target muscles that we were talking about earlier. Cool, huh? Um, Next question. If that's how the parasympathetic neurons get in there, how do the sympathetic neurons get into the eye? Well, um, all sympathetic neurons come out of the spinal cord in the thoracic levels, in maybe L1, right? So that preganglionic sympathetic neuron comes out of the spinal cord, and you know about the sympathetic trunk, right? the trunk of sympathetic ganglia running down the, the posterior thoracic cage, the posterior thoracic wall, posterior pelvis, posterior neck and what have you, right? Well, the main way the sympathetic neurons travel around the body, or one of the main ways, is by following arteries. So, of course, oh, go, go lift this up again. Right. There's the orbit, right? And then, Here's a huge red big blood vessel here, and you can see that it's covered in little white lines. What's the blood vessel? That's the internal carotid artery, because that's gone inside the cranial cavity, and it makes this whoop, S shape. And at the end of that S shape, it runs posterior to the superior orbital fissure. So postganglionic sympathetic neurons work their way up the sympathetic trunk, and then they follow the common carotid artery and internal carotid artery up into the cranial cavity and they stay with it until it runs posterior to the orbit and then they jump off. Those sympathetic nerves jump off, run through the superior orbital fissure, because everything goes through there, right? And then they run anteriorly through here and they'll take whatever route they can get to get into the eye, which means that they're going to run, some of them will run through the ciliary ganglion, they won't synapse, they're just running through, it's just cabling, it's just a convenient route for them to follow, and they, they're within also then the short ciliary nerves and they run into the eyeball and they do their sympathetic 
jobs within the eyeball, which is the motor bit we just, we just talked about. There is some discussion about sympathetic nerves also affecting the, um, the uh, ciliary body and the, uh, the lens you know, opposing the parasympathetic innovation so that when you're startled, you also focus on distant objects. Not entirely sure how true that is, but there you go. Um, so they'll do those sympathetic motor jobs we've been talking about, but also, of course, sympathetic nerves. One of the reasons they're following the arteries is because they're going to affect the smooth muscle in the artery walls and, if, and, and, and be involved in regulation of where blood goes in blood flow. So they're also going to go into the retina and into the blood vessels within the retina and control blood flow through there. Um, some of them are going to run through the long ciliary nerves because why not? You're just trying to find any way you can get from here to the eyeballs. So you go through the long ciliary nerves and that's how the sympathetic nerves and the parasympathetic nerves get into the eyeball. But there is a, another nerve going into the eyeball and it's kind of the real reason the long ciliary nerves exist, but I've got to pick up this big model again. I could do with a big, I could do with like a tall thingy, couldn't I? Right. So, um, the short ciliary nerves run between the ciliary ganglion and the eyeball. Those are the short ciliary nerves. Now really, the long ciliary nerves are running across here and this nerve here, these are branches of the trigeminal nerve that we talked about some weeks ago. We talked about the trigeminal nerve and how it innovates, you know, carries general sensory innovation from the skin of the face and the eyelid and the conjunctiva and that sort of thing, right? Now the nasociliary nerve is a branch that's going to send some general sensory fibres through these long ciliary nerves to get into the eyeball and the ultimate destination of those neurons is the, am I, can I, can I, is the cornea, right? So the, the cornea has general sensation and you notice if you try and touch it you really can't, you really don't want to. Um, and that's the, the blink reflex. So the, I mean, you're not even, if you were to touch the cornea lightly with the bud of cotton wool, you should trigger the blink, blink reflex. So general sensation is gonna travel through those general sensory neurons, through the long ciliary nerves, through the nasociliary nerves, and then back through the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve and back to the brain, and then trigger the facial nerve to close the eyelids. That, that's the blink reflex, and it should happen with both eyes, it should happen on both sides. So that was the real reason that the long ciliary nerves are there. They're actually a branch of the nasociliary nerves carrying general sensation from the cornea. The sympathetic nerves just run through there just for fun. I think that's most of the stuff that goes through the eyeball. There's obviously one big one that we haven't talked about, and that's the optic nerve. By the way, um, those, the, the general sensory nerves of the nasociliary nerve, they'll actually run through, some of those will run through the ciliary ganglion as well. Won't sign up with it, they'll just run through it and through the short ciliary nerves to get into the eyeball. These nerves, they just seem to follow whatever path they can. It's probably because in the embryo they're following similar um, chemotactic cues. Anyway, um, the, uh, the optic nerve, cranial nerve too. The optic nerve is, as I'm sure you're aware, carrying special sensory inf information back from the retina, carrying vision. And I'm not going to talk about it too much because that's another 30 minute talk all on its own. Um, suffice to say that cranial nerve two is considered a direct extension of the central nervous system. So it's not like a, a peripheral nerve in the normal sense. The retina and the optic nerve are, are an outgrowth, an extension of the forebrain, so they're quite special. And because of that, if you follow the optic nerve through the optic canal and into the orbit, it's covered by the three layers of, of connective tissue of PA mater, arachnoid mater, and dura mater with a bit of CSF and what have you. Um, and it, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say is it runs to the eye, carries vision. One thing that is worth mentioning is that Within the nerve, there is a little artery and a little vein, and those are the central retinal artery and central retinal vein, carrying blood vessels to the retina. Um, but that's it. Those are the nerves that enter the eye. So now we've talked about the intraocular muscles, 
um, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves that innervate those muscles and how they get there. We've added on a bit of general sensation and we've briefly mentioned the optic nerve. If ever we talk about the optic nerve, what we really should do is talk about the retina, the optic nerve, the optic track, tract, the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus and the thalamus and the, you know, we should follow the whole tract back and how it all crosses over and what happens when you damage different bits because that's a whole topic in its own right. Um, but we'll save that for another day. Um, Right, um, so if you see complicated diagrams of nerves going to and from the eyeball and passing through the ciliary ganglion, don't get too befuddled. Just think about the nerves are going from one place and trying to get to another place and they're just taking whatever route they can um, and the only parasympathetic neurons synapse in the ciliary ganglion. Other nerves do pass through the ciliary ganglion, but they're just passing through. It's just cabling at that point. All right. Oh, I've made a right mess now. All right. See you guys next week. <laughs>